Hello and welcome to News Click. The unholy alliance between the BJP and PDP came to an end yesterday as the BJP announced its decision to pull out of the government in the state of Jammu and Kashmir. So to talk about the future of the state and what this decision means and also the report which was released by the United Nations recently, we have with us today Gautam Nablika, a civil rights activist. So Gautam, the first question really is why does this decision come now? Because we know that this alliance was never really one which was formed on similar grounds to begin with. And the government had problems right from day one. They had, dif they had their differences. Well, if you recall, in the previous interview that I did for Newsclick, I pointed out that it's for BJP to decide what approach they're going to take with yes. 2019 elections due. Uh, whether it would be a conciliatory approach or a hardline approach that they'll persist with. Well, now it's clear, it's clear. what line they're going to take that is so true. that matter is settled. So all this hue and cry about the importance of ceasefire and the so-called offer of uh, uh, talks and all was just a lot of hot air. There was no substance to it and that became very clear. So in that context, as soon as the decision taken for not extending ceasefire was made, uh, there was no basis left then for BJP to persist with an alliance uh, which as per their calculations the, they, they were uh, losing. Hmm. It was more uh, just a written uh, understanding and a wish list. It was not nothing and, and uh, never meant to be taken seriously by any side and that is what the last four years record shows. Please remember in 2014 we had this September 2014 massive floods mm -hmm. in Jammu yes. and Kashmir. And it took two years before BJP government at the center heeded the demand of, of people in, J in Jammu and Kashmir and made available resources uh, to those who had been affected by it. So right from the beginning, BJP's attitude towards Jammu and Kashmir had been very clear. People tend to forget. It's an ideological party whose position has been consistent right from the big, from 1950s. They were the ones who started the agitation against National Conference government way back in 1950s, mm. led by Shama Prasad Mukherjee. So they, given that background, sooner or later, I mean, BJP would have, would have called off this alliance. And it was just waiting to happen. It also really puts uh, the ceasefire into question. That Was that really a decision? I mean, to expect the ceasefire to succeed in such a short duration of time without any proper political talks and to then state that as a reason for calling off the alliance also really puts the whole decision of announcing the ceasefire in the first place. Really, like that becomes questionable. Please remember, the actual fact is that it was Dineshwar Sharma the government appoint representative who pushed for ceasefire, Ministry of Home Affairs accepted it mm. and this was communicated to the state government, PDP, in the middle of an all-party meeting where the suggestion came from uh, MLA engineer Rashid mm. and CPM's, CPIM's uh, uh, MLA Tarigami. Uh, uh, PDP picked it up and made it appear as if it was their, their suggestion. So their own person is responsible for what today mm. BJP accuses PDP of, of doing mm. and for therefore mishandling so-called law and order problem. And I think that, that itself says a lot because it's obviously an attempt at passing the buck, all the blame onto somebody else. And also there are of course a lot of uh, news going on about how this is coming right before the elections, before the th uh, 2019 elections and like what do you think is the importance of this, of this decision for the upcoming general elections? Well I think we'll know very soon on June 23rd when Amit Shah uh, uh, speaks on the death anniversary of uh, SP Mukherjee, Shama Prasad Mukherjee. I expect that he would be making announcement in line with their ideological stance vis-a-vis -vis Kashmir. So, I mean, that is going to be a hard line. That operation All Out is going to pick up and become more uh, All Out offensive uh, with no restraint. The reaction of the people of the state is 
has been somewhat positive to this end of the government because like I, as what I've seen, uh, people are happy about the end of this opportunistic government. But is there really a reason for celebration now? Because I don't think there is. Now the governor will be coming into rule, will be ruling the state. So how would that affect the state now? Well, governor's rule has never been uh, a very happy uh, experience for Jammu and Kashmir, notwithstanding what people claim. Uh, the, the governor's rule has always been the period when massive encroachments were made in the constitutional autonomy uh, uh, given to Jammu and Kashmir. So governor's rule has played a very important role in, in hollowing out of autonomy. Even the previous stunt, uh, stint of uh, NN Vora when um, uh, Mehbooba Mufti mm. for three months mm. uh, was uh, still undecided whether she would take on the mantle of chief ministership or not. Those three months showed very clearly which way the governor was headed. Mm. He was doing precisely the things that the BJP and RSS wanted to push in Jammu and Kashmir. Once the elected government was formed, then many of those decisions were reviewed and uh, were rejected. Mm -hmm. The only thing is, and I hope that uh, that acts is, that the UN uh, Office of Human Rights Council's uh, report, mm -hmm. which has come out recently, that I hope that it acts as a restraint on the government mm -hmm. and that they realize that the world's eyes would be international public opinion would uh, any violation, any atrocity that is committed against in, in Jammu and Kashmir mm -hmm. will be taken note of by international public much more uh, than otherwise. So coming to the report, what do you have to say about the findings of the report? Well, one, the most interesting thing is that the Indian newspapers have written a lot about about the report and about its immorality mm -hmm. and found faults with the report attributing all kind of charges. I mean, Times of India went to the extent of pointing out that these people's funding, where it came from, made it suspicious that they are independent and things like that. Mm -hmm. Not once did India think of it when they were supporting uh, the demand of the international community to criticize and demand an uh, international inquiry into atrocities committed in Sri Lanka, for instance. Hmm. India backed that demand. Of course, uh, there are also allegations of the Office of the uh, Human Rights Council that the, of it being biased against India. Yeah, I mean, for some obscure reason, I don't know why they would be biased because this is the first time. Hmm. I mean, bias would be if there had been a consistent and uh, reporting about Jammu and Kashmir, our lament is that it's rather late for them to intervene. And nobody talks about, none of the media has even bothered to or have displayed even the courage to come out and refer to what the report has to say. Hmm. It's an extremely well documented, well researched, rigorously researched, hmm. very well sourced and its language is remarkably sober and polite, mm. despite talking about a matter which is horrendous, mm. it's, 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 it's a report which deserves to be read mm. and to be understood and engaged with. Without reading to criticize something, I think it only shows uh, the intellectual imbe imbe imbecility that prevails in this country where the, uh, the corporate media is concerned. And this report is remarkable. It points out India's international obligations that it is a signatory, a signatory to and therefore must live by mm. and the violations therefore they point out of all the legal obligations that India carries as a member country mm. and as a signatory to say international uh, uh, the civil and political rights mm. on uh, various covenants which we have signed but we have not ratified like on torture, enforced disappearances or co covenants that we have signed and ratified like the one on children, mm -hmm. one on, on, on discrimination and violence against women, etc, etc. It's reminding us that we are signatory to all this. So we are in violation of this in Kashmir. I mean for 30 years it points out that the justice has not been delivered. And the, obviously, the, if you reading between the line, it makes it clear that ex, under the existing 
system of criminal jurisprudence and, 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 and how in a conflict area and in a disturbed area, the criminal courts uh, do not exercise jurisdiction over armed forces. Therefore, the, 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 the inability of civilians to get, to yes. get justice yes. for crimes that are inflicted on them, committed on them, and not just in Jammu and Kashmir, in Northeast for much longer. Mm. We may claim that Kashmir is a law and order problem as everybody wants to pretend it yeah. is. It is not. Kashmir is a disturbed area mm. where armed forces uh, of the Union, Army as well as the Central Paramilitary Forces have been provided legal immunity through AFSPA mm. for anything that they do in this area. It's an armed conflict area, it's not a peace area. Mm. The criminal jurisdiction does not operate in a, in, a, in a disturbed area. So it's much closer to and therefore international humanitarian laws that come into play in armed conflict or war situations apply or are guidelines or they, are the, they ought to be the guidelines hmm. for any of the, of the, of, uh, of the fighting forces uh, of, the, you know, the, of the belligerents on, on either side, uh, either the state or the non-state subject of uh, forces in this matter. Yeah, the report has pointed out the violations committed by the militants as well, by the armed exactly. groups in the state. But at the same time, it points out how India is in violation of not just uh, international human rights, mm. but also international human humanitarian laws, which apply in armed conflict and war situation. This is hypocrisy. We want a permanent seat in United Nations Security Council, but we don't want to abide by any of the international obligations. So we want to be like the bunch of five uh, who rule the rules, who follow no laws, uh, to whom no laws and rules apply. We want to be one of those evil doers in the world, as, to use a uh, you know, colorful word. Uh, rather than be part of of uh, some uh, of a of a country which which abides by and lives up to its international obligations and pushes for it, mm. I mean, we, instead of taking a moral high ground, we are stooping low and trying to compare ourselves with the worst, like the U.S., U.K., France, Russia, and China, mm. uh, to, cl to to claim uh, that these rules and obligations don't apply to us, mm. which is rather strange. In fact, its timing is also very significant and now coincides with the, with the imposition of governor's rule in Jammu and Kashmir because even if the Indian, if Indian media and the corporate houses and uh, the pracharaks and the supporters ignore uh, this report and the international public opinion, um, other progressive and democratic minded Indians will not. Mm. And together with them, the international public opinion is going to be a little more alert yeah. than in the past, now that this report has come. So if any atrocity or killing or massacre mm. takes place, mark my word, it's not going to be like old times, where the world would ignore whatever happens. It would be different. And let me add, this report and this committee and this council was praised mm. by most of the world for the really meticulous work they did on the, on, on the atrocities commit, being committed by, uh, by Israeli forces on the Palestinians mm. recently. It's the same council. Mm. While we welcome the report, uh, unfortunately the kind of attitude displayed by the government of India and its, and its acolytes uh, make it clear that they are not going to allow that to act as a restraint on them. India has also always been very, uh, of course, even now they did not want the UN to actually come and investigate. That's why the remote monitoring was done. So do you think after this report that might change the recommendation of the Office of the Human Rights Commissioner to carry out investigations in Kashmir? Will that finally be accepted? Unfortunately, since it's the UN Security Council that decides with the five veto powers there, India will be working hard on one of them to put, you know, use the veto against it. So I don't see international inquiry getting anywhere. But this document still stays. Its recommendations, its research still stays. 
it lends credibility to all the work that civil liberties and democratic rights organizations have done, especially in Jammu and Kashmir by the Kashmiris themselves. Mm. It lends credibility to their work. So for anybody to believe that we would have escaped because there won't be any international inquiry, well, that could be one, that will be an outcome, uh, unfortunately, to expect given the nature of international politics and how it operates. But uh, it's not something that India would be very happy in the medium and the long term. Apart from uh, calling the report biased, the critique has also been that Burhan Wani has been called a leader and not a terrorist. Groups like Hezbollah Mujahideen have been called armed groups and not terrorist groups. What do you think of these criticisms? Well, I don't read, read too much into it. In the first place, I welcome. I'm happy. They've called them what they are. Hezbollah Mujahideen is not a terrorist organization as far as I'm concerned. It's an indigenous militant organization. Government of India can claim whatever they want to. But Government of India's definition of things are not necessarily something that are acceptable to everybody. And just because they decide to call their own people nationalists and patriots when we know that they engaged in terrorist acts and heinous crimes of the worst kind and they're the most foul-mouthed uh, people, uh, despite that we don't call them, uh, them terrorist or, or, uh, or any such thing. Yes, whereas I do make a distinction between Hezbollah personally, between Hezbollah Mujahideen, which is an indigenous force, and Lashkar and jaish e mohammed whom I do not consider as indigenous force. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, yes, uh, criticism is valid. But will name calling necessarily help? No. Identify the crimes that they have committed. Mm -hmm. Bring them to book for crimes that they have committed. Criticize them for their ideological orientation. Yes, perfectly valid. And that's what we engage in also. But to abuse somebody, to use it as some kind of a, you know, it's a, a, a to junk somebody, to, to take away agency and history and motivation mm -hmm. from a movement, from people in struggle. I think that's, that's I think, all governments engage in them and we reject it, people reject it, especially progressive and democratic minded people, so must we do it. And those are minor things. The substantive issues of the report nevertheless yeah. uh, To stand. use these as grounds yeah, for dismissing yeah, yeah, the yeah. entire report yeah. is... You have to engage with substance, not with these nomenclatures and uh, name dropping. Uh, that gets us nowhere. Thank you Gautam for joining us today and thank you for watching this book.